In this lecture, we're going to take a quick look at Newton's second law. Suppose r of t is a vector valued function representing the position of some object at time t. And we'll assume here that we're working in xyz space, so we have an object traveling in three dimensional space. Then the first derivative, r prime of t, is another vector. We've called that the tangent vector if we were to graph the space curve swept out by r of t or parametrized by r of t. But r prime of t is a derivative. So it's a rate of change. And when we compute the derivative, it's the limit of a difference quotient, which is the change in outputs divided by the change in inputs. The outputs is the position. So if we're working with SI units, that would be meters. The change in inputs is the change in T values. So we have meters per second. So that's what gives us velocity. We could have other units, of course. We could have feet per hour or something like that. But just as an example, one unit you would associate to velocity is meters per second. Then the second derivative, r double prime, is the rate of change of velocity. So if you were to write down change in outputs over change in inputs, for that difference quotient, you would have meters per second per second. So that's meters per second squared, and that's our acceleration vector. OK, so we have position, velocity, and acceleration. Now suppose some force is acting on this object, causing it to move along some trajectory. Newton's second law tells us that the total force acting on the object is equal to the mass of the object times its acceleration. Or in other words, if we think of the total force as a vector, that would be the mass, which is a scalar quantity, times the acceleration vector. So you can write m times a of t, or if you want to relate that back to the original vector valued position function, it would be m times the second derivative, r double prime. In this unit, we're going to assume that the only force acting on our objects is gravity. So we don't have air resistance or a motor driving the object. Nobody's going to push on the object. It's just gravity. So for modeling an object traveling in three-dimensional space, we want to imagine that, say, the ground is like the xy plane. If something is traveling laterally on the ground, they would just be traveling in the xy plane. But if there's any vertical motion, that would be in the z direction. So we think of up as traveling in the z direction, or traveling down as traveling in the z direction. So if the only force acting on our objects is gravity, then we can say that the total force acting on the object would be the mass of the object times the gravitational constant, the correct number for that depends on what units you're working in, times negative k. So this right here is a scalar. I will adopt the convention that g here is a positive number, mass is a positive number. So then our sense of direction is negative k just to give us one unit down. Right, so the magnitude of the force is the size of the scalar. And then by taking that scalar and multiplying it by negative k, we get our sense of direction. You could also think of this as the vector 0, 0, negative mg. But then according to Newton's second law, this is also going to be equal to m times the second derivative of the position function. So our conclusion is that r double prime of t, our acceleration vector, is going to have the form 0, 0, negative g, where g is, of course, the gravitational constant. We'll work through a couple examples. Our first example is an example of free fall motion. So an object at the top of a building 100 feet high is thrown upward with an initial speed of 18 feet per second. Find when it hits the ground. Okay, for me the first step is, is usually to draw a picture. Okay, so there's our building. It's 100 feet high. We have to pay attention to our units here. So we're working with feet. Okay, let's say here's the object. We're going to throw it straight up with an initial speed of 18 feet per second. Okay, when you're working with feet, the gravitational constant is 32 feet per second squared. So I usually start with acceleration, integrate to get to velocity, then integrate to get to the position function. So let me first write down a of t. 
We know this is the second derivative of the position function, so I'll write r double prime. And this is the vector 0, 0, negative 32, as we just discussed. Now we integrate this to get velocity. So v of t, or in other words, r prime of t. To integrate a vector value function, we integrate coordinate by coordinate. So I'll just go ahead and say the antiderivative of 0 dt for the first two coordinates. Normally I wouldn't bother to write that out, but this is our first example, so let me do that. And then we'll also integrate on negative 32 dt. Okay, you can probably eyeball that that's going to be some constant for both of the first two coordinates. And then the antiderivative of negative 32 would be negative 32 t plus another constant. To figure out these constants, we have to have a better understanding of our initial motion because this is going to give us our initial velocity v of zero. So in particular, notice that v of zero is going to be parallel to k because we throw it straight up. And then the speed is a scalar, it's 18 feet per second. But because our vector is parallel to k, we can work out that, hey, that must be the vector 0, 0, 18. We know it has to have length 18 and point in the direction of k, so that's the only possibility. So this tells us that c1 and c2 both have to be 0. And then if we look at the third coordinate, we plug in t equals 0 and we're left with c3, that has to be 18. Okay, so now we can write down that the velocity vector in general at time t is the vector 0, 0, negative 32 t plus 18. Okay, let me give myself some more room. Okay, now we integrate again to get the position function. This tells us that r of t, and here I'm not going to write out the anti-differentiation process because we're just working with pretty basic components. So we integrate zero and we get another constant. Integrate zero, get another constant. And then anti-differentiate negative 32 t plus 18, and we get negative 16 t squared plus 18 t plus a third constant. Okay, what are these constants? Well, that's our initial position. So where did we start? But it makes sense to say that the edge of this building has an x-coordinate of zero, right? So that's like some sort of lateral side-to-side -side motion. Same thing for the y-coordinate. So let's say that the side of this building is really like the z-axis. So the first two coordinates of r of 0 will both be 0. And then for the third coordinate, it makes sense to say that the height of the building is 100, the ground is 0. Right, so this is the origin. So the third coordinate of our initial position is 100. Okay, so r of 0 is 0, 0, 100. That tells us that d1 and d2 both have to be 0. And d3, after plugging in t equals 0 into that third coordinate, d3 has to be 100. OK, so now we can write down our position function. r of t is 0, 0, negative 16t squared plus 18t plus 100. If we were asked to find the position function, we would be done. But that's not what we were asked. We were asked to find when this object is going to hit the ground. In other words, when does it reach the origin? So let me go on to a new slide. We need to solve the question, for what value of t does r of t equal 0, 0, 0? This just amounts to using the quadratic equation to solve the third coordinate equaling 0. So we, we want to have negative 16t squared plus 18t plus 100 equals 0. Let me divide everything by negative 2, and we get 8t squared minus 9t minus 50 equals 0. Uh, maybe that factors, but I'm just going to go ahead and use the quadratic equation. So t is going to be 9 plus or minus the square root of b squared, so 81 minus 4 times a times c, so minus 4 times 8 times negative 50, all over 2a, so 16. All right, so that's 9 plus or minus the square root of 
1519, all over 16. If you compute those two values, one is positive, one is negative. We want the positive version. So we get when time is 9 plus the square root of 1519 divided by 16, which is approximately 3 seconds. It's approximately 2 point, let's say 998 seconds. In reality, we didn't really need three components in a vector to solve this equation. Right, you may have solved it by just setting up this quadratic and ignoring the x and y components and just looking at the vertical motion only, and that's fine. But I wanted to show how it relates to writing down a vector valued function in R3. Okay, let's take a look at this example of projectile motion. So we have a student engineering team launching a rocket off a table one meter high at a speed of 40 meters per second in the direction of the vector one, two, three. What was the launch angle with the ground? And then once we've set up the position function, how far does the ball travel? So the first thing we need to do is model this problem in R3. If this team is launching a rocket off of a table one meter high, it makes sense to call the launch point 001. Okay, let me sketch R3 and we'll try to draw this fairly accurately. So we're gonna have the z-axis, the y-axis and the x-axis. We're going to launch from a height of one meter in the direction of one, two, three. So that's like one unit down the x-axis, two units down the y-axis, and three units up the z-axis. So we are going to launch in a direction parallel to the vector one, two, three. Notice that's the vector that starts at the origin and lands on the point one, two, three. That's not actually the initial velocity vector because we know our initial velocity vector should have a length or a magnitude of 40, right? So having a speed of 40 meters per second tells us that the length of the initial velocity is 40. We're looking for the angle made here. So that angle theta I just labeled is the launch angle with the ground. So here we have a right angle. Notice that the line segments enclosing this angle theta form a right triangle with this vertical line segment parallel to the z axis I've drawn over here. In fact, theta is enclosed between the hypotenuse and a leg of this right triangle. But then this leg here that we're kind of missing is the hypotenuse of a right triangle whose sides are one and two. That comes from the information from this launch direction. So that tells us that the length of the line segment that I drew in the first quadrant of the xy plane is the square root of four plus one, or it's the square root of five. Okay, and then the height of this right triangle is three. In other words, this other leg length is three. So we have the opposite and adjacent legs for the right triangle that theta is a part of. So tangent of theta is three over the square root of five. That's opposite over adjacent. So that tells me that theta is the arctan of three over the square root of five. And that's approximately 0.93 radians or 53.3 degrees. We know our acceleration vector is going to be zero, zero, negative 9.8 since we're working with meters, that would be the gravitational constant. We would integrate that to get the velocity before we do that, let's work out what the initial velocity vector needs to look like. So we know the initial velocity vector can be written as its length times a parallel unit vector. Moreover, we know the length of the velocity vector needs to be 40. And our velocity vector is parallel to 1, 2, 3. That's not a unit vector, but we can easily turn it into a unit vector by dividing it by its own magnitude. The length of the vector one, two, three is, is the square root of 14. So the initial velocity vector is 40 times one, two, three divided by the square root of 14. 
Okay, so our acceleration vector, as I already said, is 0, 0, negative 9.8. That means that the velocity vector is a constant, a constant, negative 9.8 t plus a constant. Now if we compare this vector to the velocity vector that we just found for our initial launch, we can say that c1, c2, c3 are the coordinates of the initial velocity vector. That way when we plug in t equals 0, we get back v of 0. OK, let me slide this up. We get the position function from integrating the velocity vector. So we'll have r of t is 40t plus the square root of 14 plus 0 because we're initially launching from 0, 0, 1. So 40t over the square root of 14 plus a constant of 0. Likewise, for the y component, we're going to have 80t divided by the square root of 14. And then since we're launching from a y coordinate of 0, our constant of integration is 0. And then lastly, we have negative 4.9t squared plus 120t divided by the square root of 14 plus 1 because our initial z coordinate is 1. We still need to find how far the ball travels. So that question is actually asking, how far does this ball travel in the xy plane? So if I walk from the table where we launched it to its landing point, how far would I walk? OK, let me just copy over the position function. In order to figure out how far this ball travels, we first need to figure out when it lands. So for what t value does the z coordinate equal 0? We just did an example with the quadratic formula, so I'm going to do this one in my calculator. It's not a very interesting calculation. And we get t is approximately 6.58. How do we figure out how far the ball traveled? Well, we launched the ball from here, and it lands somewhere in the xy plane. So what we're looking for is the length of the line segment in the xy plane connecting the origin to the landing coordinates for x and y. So how far it traveled is going to be the x coordinate when it lands squared plus the y coordinate when it lands squared square rooted. So we're going to figure out the x and y coordinates and then compute the distance between those coordinates and the origin in the xy plane. OK, so it's the square root of 40 times 6.58. You can try to be more exact than that if you want to by not rounding quite so early. But anyway, 40 times that time value divided by the square root of 14, that quantity squared, plus same thing for the y coordinate. So we have 80 times the landing time divided by the square root of 14, that quantity squared. Add those together and take the square root, and that gives us the distance that this rocket traveled. And we get that it traveled approximately 157.2 meters. Okay, those are the examples I brought forward for freefall motion and projectile motion. For me, the first step is always to visualize what's happening as much as possible. So I advise you to sketch a picture and start labeling where's the origin, where's your sense of direction, etc. Okay, good luck solving these problems. Thank you for your attention.